It was Father's Day recently, and I thought, what a great time for some dad jokes. Here's the jokes. What do you call an alligator in a vest? An investigator. I don't trust stairs. They're always up to something. Did you know you can get paid for sleeping? It's a dream job. So many good jokes. All right, let's get started. Benign prosthetic hyperplasia is a large prostate. This happens to men as they age and it's a normal process. This happens because of the DHT levels. DHT stands for dihydrotestosterone and it increases with age. And what DHT does is help make more prostate. It helps make the prostate bigger. So as the man ages, DHT levels go up and so does the prostate size. By the time men are 85 years old, 90% of them will have BPH. The early signs and symptoms of BPH is going to be a decrease of the force of the stream. So the urine coming out is going to be weak. Later on, they can get urinary retention. So the bladder gets filled with urine and it can even get distended. Nocturia, which means they can pee at night. Urinary urgency and frequency and this urgency means they have to go all of a sudden frequency means they have to go very often and then hesitancy it means they try and go but it doesn't want to come out they can also get something called dribbling which is after they're done urinating some of the urine can still come out because the bladder wasn't emptied fully now the main complication is urinary retention this is something that we learned in funds and we need to know what type of complications it can cause so urinary retention is when the patient can't pee it has, there's a lot of reasons why the patient wouldn't be able to pee. It could be a weak detrusor muscle. It could be BPH, like we're talking about right now. It could be renal calculi, so a kidney stone. All of this is going to cause the patient not to be able to pee, and they're going to have the signs and symptoms of bladder distension, pain, and a post-void residual above 200 mLs. This means after they urinate, they're still going to have more than 200 mLs in the bladder. Some of the complications that come with not fully emptying out the bladder and keeping urine in there can include overflow incontinence, which means the bladder gets so full that some of the urine comes out without the patient wanting it to. Acute kidney injury can happen. This happens when the BPH or the obstruction blocks the urine from going out and the urine actually backs up. It backs up from the bladder, up the ureters, and into the kidneys and it causes damage. This is acute kidney injury. It's one of the reasons why acute kidney injury would happen. They'll have a decrease in GFR, which means glomerular filtration rate. It's just how well the kidneys filter. We'll talk about that some other time. And an increase in BUN and creatinine. Another complication can be UTI. This is because the urine just sits in the bladder and bacteria can start growing. The patient will have fever. It burns when they're pee. That's called dysuria. Super pubic pain. And this means they probably have a lower UTI called cystitis or CVA or flank pain. CVA stands for costa vertebral angle pain or flank pain. And this is where the kidneys are on your back and it's usually because of an upper UTI. So those are all the complications that urinary retention can cause. Now, well, how can we help the patient prevent this? How can we help them pee? So a lot of the stuff that we can do are nursing interventions, not medications. So we can have the patient stand up. We can have them ambulate. That really gets the urine going. We can run the water faucet, so let the water run so they can hear it. We can pour warm water over their genitals. We can do bladder training, which means we have them go every three hours. We tell them to hold their urine until the three hours is up and then they can go. We also want to avoid giving anticholinergics to patients with uh, urinary retention. Anticholinergics dry up secretions and they cause urinary retention. And the two meds you should know is atropine and scopolamine. And then the last thing we can do is catheterize the patient. Now, before we catheterize, there's some stuff that you have to do. The first step is assess the abdomen. Touch the area where their bladder is and see if it's distended. See if the patient feels any tenderness. Then we want to get a bladder scanner and we want to scan their bladder to see how much urine there is. There's usually going to be 400 to 600 mLs of urine in there, but there could be more. The last step we want to do is actually catheterize them. Now, if it's going to be in the hospital, it has to be sterile. When you insert a Foley or you do straight caths, it has to be sterile when it's in a healthcare setting. But if they're going to do it at home on their own, it can be clean technique, not sterile.
All right, so now we're done with urinary retention. Let's talk again about BPH. Now, the diagnostics for BPH are going to go in this order. The first thing we want to get done is a PSA, prostate-specific antigen. This checks for prostate cancer. It's a blood draw. You have to make sure before the patient gets this, they have no sex, nothing in their butt, so no digital rectal exams, and no saw palmetto. This is an herbal medication we'll talk about in a bit. The second thing that should can be done is a DRE, a digital rectal exam. The provider will insert their finger into their butt, into their anus, and they're going to literally just feel for an enlarged prostate. This should be done after 50. The last thing that can be done is a transrectal ultrasound. And this is done after the PSA and the DRE come back positive. All right, now for the nursing interventions for BPH, really they're just nursing interventions for urinary retention. So essentially, we have to catheterize them. That's the way we get the urine out. We can also do bladder training, and we want to tell the patient to avoid irritants to the bladder like caffeine, spicy food, soda. Now, the medical interventions. There's these drugs called, they have a crazy long name. It's called 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, like finasteride and dutasteride. Now, what these do is they stop DHT. Now, these take a long time to work, like three months. And they have pretty bad side effects like decrease in libido, gy gynecomastia, so they get man boobs. And you have to make sure you don't touch this drug if you're pregnant. That's because this drug can be absorbed through the skin if you touch the tablet and it'll cause birth defects in male babies. So as you can imagine, patients don't stay on this drug very long because of these side effects. The next class of drugs is alpha adrenergic blockers like tamsulosin and doxazosin. These relax the smooth muscle around the prostate, but they also relax the smooth muscle around the entire body, so they cause orthostatic hypotension. That's one of the side effects, so make sure you check blood pressure before giving this drug. They also cause retrograde ejaculation, which means when the male ejaculates, it'll go into the bladder and not outside, causing a decrease in sensation. Some other treatment could be herbal therapy. Patients can self-medicate with something called saw palmetto. This is an herb that can help with the symptoms of BPA. The side effect of this is going to be bleeding. Now, once many years have passed and the prostate's grown and grown and gotten larger, and it's become increasingly difficult to pass urine, the patient's going to have to get something called a TERP, or transurethral resection of the prostate. This is when they go in with a special tool into the penis, and then they remove some of the prostate that's obstructing the urine flow. A lot of patients are worried about this procedure and are worried that it can cause erectile dysfunction. Make sure you teach them that it does not cause erectile dysfunction. After the TERP, there's going to be bleeding inside of the penis, and we're going to have to stop that bleeding. Now, how do we stop bleeding? We put pressure on it. How do we put pressure inside the penis? We put a really big foley. This is a three-way foley that's going to provide pressure and irrigation on the site. The irrigation is used to prevent obstructions from clots that can build up when the blood just stays in that area. Here's a picture of how that looks. We see how the Foley has three lumens, one for the balloon to be inflated, one for the irrigation bag, and one for the urine to be drained. Now our job as nurses is to titrate this continuous bladder irrigation. Now there's no set rate. We want to titrate this to the color light pink. So we want the urine coming out, we want the irrigation coming out to be light pink in the drainage bag. Now if there's a clot, what you're going to see is no urine flowing out because there's a clot in the way. And what you want to do if there's a clot is manually irrigate it. That means you're going to get a large syringe, you're going to fill it up with water or saline, and then you're going to push it into where the irrigation bag goes, and you're going to draw it back out. And you're going to repeat that process many times until you get all the clots out. The other thing that can happen is a spasm, and if spasms happen, you want to give a drug called belladonna. It's a suppository that's given to stop spasms. Just like any other Foley, make sure the patient voids within six hours of the Foley being removed. All right, now the discharge teaching. The patient still needs to get a PSA done to check for prostate cancer. The need to report any signs and symptoms of infection because the Foley was in there. The main sign of infection to report is a fever, which is any temperature above 100.4. And then the patient should also know that they should expect incontinence. This is because of a weak sphincter that's caused by the big Foley being inside while it's being irrigated. Now, incontinence is something that we learned in fundamentals, but let's review it real quick. So urinary incontinence is when the patient pees themselves. The first type is called stress incontinence. 
This is caused by sneezing, coughing, or laughing. This usually happens after pregnancy. The pressure builds up and then the pee comes out. Now, what you want to do for this patient is have them do pelvic floor muscle exercises. They're also called Kegel exercises. The next type of incontinence is called urge incontinence. And this is when all of a sudden the patient feels an urge to pee. This is because of an overreactive bladder that's caused by many diseases. Now, what you want to do for this patient is do bladder training, meaning have them go pee every two to three hours on a schedule. Tell them to hold it until the three hours are up. Then they can go pee. Make sure you take the confused patient to the bathroom. It's not enough to tell the patient go pee at, in three hours because they're going to forget. They're confused. Make sure you take them to the bathroom. You can also give an antispasmodic like oxybutynin to stop spasms of the bladder that's causing the incontinence. The next kind is called overflow incontinence, and this is because the bladder is too full because of an obstruction. The treatment for this is going to be to catheterize. The next kind of incontinence is called reflex incontinence, and this is caused by a spinal cord injury, and the treatment is also catheterization. The last type of incontinence is called functional incontinence, and this is when the patient can't make it to the bathroom for whatever reason. Maybe they can't walk, maybe they're paraplegic, maybe they can't um, talk and ask for help. Maybe they can't, they just can't make it to the bathroom for whatever reason. Your job is to make it easier to make it to the bathroom, so get them a bedside commode. All right, guys, that's everything you need for BPH.